welcome back to Storytime with David Booker. Appreciate you coming back and joining me for another reading from The Reluctant Left Hand of God. As you know, we've already done the first two chapters, so now we're going to start Chapter 3, Mission Implausible. Let's begin where we left off. Now, God was not insensitive to the grumbles and accusations regarding his favorite. He thought it might be a good idea to send the run to earth for a while. There was a group of people called the Nanaivites who were veering into dangerous habits. He felt if he sent a representative to call and explain matters to them, then maybe they might change their ways. He was tempted to go in person, but he wanted to see how the run would do as an intermediary. He explained to the run his mission and explained in no uncertain terms that he was to pick a person to actually do the job. It was better for one of the people to get the rewards and fame than one of the angels. The runt packed a small rucksack and flew down to earth. He decided to pick someone from Israel as it was one of God's favorite places. The runt landed in an inconspicuous area and tucked, his, tucked in his wings. He gave him a slightly hunchbacked appearance, but since there were plenty of others similarly afflicted, he wasn't worried about it. He walked around looking for a likely person to send. He came upon a forlorn man sitting on a mat by the side of the street. The runt sat next to him. So, what you doing? The man looked at the runt and shrugged. Well, I don't want to be a prophet. I can't seem to get anyone to take notice, much less hear me out. The runt grinned. He had found the perfect person in no time. Hell, what you need is to do something big. I mean, really big. Something that makes your name a household word. The man looked nervous. What do you have in mind? The monk rubbed his hands together. My profitable friend, I'm in need of someone to do something for God, and you're the very man I was looking for. The man scooched away and drew his blanket tight around him. Throat butt walked over closer to him. What's your name? The man drew in his blanket. Jonah. The monk placed a hand on his shoulder. Well, Jonah, how would you like a trip to the capital of Assyria, all expenses paid? Jonah's face turned pale. But, but they're our enemy. They hate us. Ron shrugged. Yeah, I know. But God thinks if you go and warn them that he'll demolish your city, they just might change your ways. So what do you say? Ready for that trip? He dug Jonah in the ribs. Jonah covered his head and ran as fast as he could to his house. He double locked the door, shut the windows, and hid under a blanket under the bed. When he opened his eyes from under the blanket, he was greeted by the grunt who was laying on the floor with his chin in, on his fist, grinning from ear to ear. Boo, I found you. Now it's my turn and you have to find me. Jonah crawled out and sat on the floor next to the runt. Why pick me? The runt patted him on his, the back. Sorry, but well, it's just how it goes. You want to be a prophet and I happen to need a prophet. You help me, and when you come back, you'll be a famous prophet, and people will be lined up to hear you. Jonah went downstairs and looked at the doors and windows. All were as he left them. Locked tight, yet this person had gotten in without disturbing anything. He turned around and bumped into the run. Well, since you got in so quick, I'm thinking maybe you really do come from God. The run turned around and let a bit of his wings show. Yep. So are you ready? Jonah filled a sack with clothes and other things he might need. The run handed him a purse of coins and directed him to the docks. Now you take the first boat headed to, ne to Neva, and you tell him what God wants. Jonah headed outside and ran to the docks. The run was so pleased at how easy this mission was turning out that he strolled up to the nearest inn to refresh himself. A couple of beers and a game of darts later, he felt it might be a good idea to check in with God and let him know the progress. He went out of town and tucked his wings and started upwards. From high up in the air, he spotted Jonah on a boat. The grunt grunted acknowledgement that Jonah was on his way. He climbed a little higher and suddenly realized that Jonah was headed in the opposite direction. Irritated at Jonah for not doing as he was told, the run descended swiftly and beat his wings so that waves overlapped the side of the boat. The sailors were not used to seeing the water this attitude and began to pray. Jonah cleared his throat. Uh, excuse me. I think I might just be the reason that for that's happening. 
He explained what he was asked to do and that out of fright he had done the opposite. The captain grabbed Jonah by the collar and half dragged, half carried him to the side and literally kicked him overboard. Jonah didn't know how to swim. He sank once and the rum tried to catch hold of him. He couldn't grasp him and was looking for something to scoop him out with. Over to the side he saw a whale. Grinning and laughing, he zoomed over and sat astride it. He kicked with his heels and the whale sped forward. The run waved his halo in the air and sang a quick yippee ki yay ki yi When he neared where Jonah was floundering in the water, he roared out to the whale, Dive! 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 The whale zeroed in on Jonah, opened his mouth, and swallowed him. Back on the surface, the run turned the whale towards Assyria and prodded it forwards. From inside the whale, he could hear Jonah yelling to be let out. The run walked on the whale's back to the blowhole and yelled down, You can't come out because you were bad and didn't do what you promised. Now you get there the hard way and I'm not going to rush. You'll spend three days down there and like it. Jonah grumbled as he sat on one of the ribs and bit into a raw fish. I don't think I'm going to like it one bit. I heard that yelled the run down the hole and just to put Jonah in his place. He had the whale dive and then breach high in the air, coming down with a thunderous splash. Jonah promptly threw up. Three days later, they landed off the coast of Assyria near the capital city. The whale opened his mouth and Jonah crawled out, smelling distinctly of fish. The runt reached into his bag and handed Jonah a bar of soap and told him to clean up or no one would come near them, let alone let him see the king. When he came out of the water, clean and smelling much better, the runt handed him a comb and dictated what he was to say. It took three days to get to the capital, and all the way Jonah prophesied that God's destruction was coming if they didn't change their ways. Now the city was a hotbed of vice and corruption. All along the way, Jonah could see the graves of people who had been tortured and burned. As he passed a group, he heard them talking about how the king had boiled a prophet, and since they were still alive, cut their tongue out, and then their eyes. Now, this didn't do much to quell the fear or settle the churning in his stomach. He kept looking around as he preached, checking to see that the runt was still with him. Had the runt left, it is probable Jonah would have hightailed it out the nearest exit. As Jonah neared the capital, the runt stood behind Jonah, and as Jonah spoke, the runt allowed just a little of his presence to be felt and seen. When the runt wasn't as tall as Gabriel, or as ominous looking as Satan, but just the fact that behind Jonah was a winged being just visible was enough. The people heard, including the king. Jonah wasn't sure if it was the way he spoke with authority or for some other reason, but the people took him seriously and put on sackcloths and fasted. The runt was delighted and put Jonah on the best boat for Israel. He soared back home doing loops and wide banking turns. His first commission in it had almost ended badly. If he hadn't seen Jonah on the boat, he would have failed and that been at the mercy of the other angels. He flew into the tap room of heaven and was greeted by God with a high five and a well done. The other angels grudgingly congratulated the run on a successful mission, hoping secretly that the next would be a miserable failure. God had been receiving reports that his favorites were being persecuted. Of course, they were always saying they were being persecuted. Being God's favorites, they had begun to feel every setback was persecution, and God had just let them gripe without doing much about it. He sent a couple of angels down there, though, just on the off chance something really was going on. Well, just imagine his surprise when, yes, his people were actually being persecuted. God harumped and felt it was time for a little intervention. Coming down outside of Egypt, he whistled for the run to accompany him, feeling he might need the run to cheer him up a little. The run sped down and waited nearby. God was occupied and thinking about how to get his people out of there. He didn't want to just show up and scoop them in his hand, then dump them somewhere else. He liked having someone else acting as an intermediary. He'd do the work, God would assist, then the prophet would get the credit and fame, and people would believe in God through it. It was a simple process, and it worked, so why change it? He sent the runt out looking for a likely prospect. The runt had only gotten to the edge of the mountain when he saw someone coming up. 
Rushing back to God, he saw God had set a bush alight and was reading the latest news by its light. The light glowing from the top of the mountain was probably why the person had climbed up. God saw the man as he clambered over the edge and laid down his paper, ready to speak to the man. The runt whispered in God's ear, which made God chuckle and indicate for the runt to proceed. The man came nearer and examined the bush. The runt threw his voice so it sounded as if it was coming from the middle of the bush. Take your shoes off and sit down. We need to talk. The man unloosed his sandals and kneeled. I want you to go see Pharaoh and tell him that the Israelites uh, have to leave so they can worship God. The man looked upset. Why do you send me? The runt looked over at God and God shrugged and let the runt commence. Well, you're the one who came up here, so you go and tell Pharaoh what I said. Mo still wasn't convinced he really needed to do this, so he tried to worm his way out of it. Look, I don't speak real well. I stammer, I stutter, I spit when I say lots of words. Maybe you better be better with someone else. He stood up and backed away. Tell you what, I'll get my brother. He's a real good speaker. God slapped his forehead and made the fire burn red to show he wasn't pleased. The runt understood. Get your brother by all means, but you're still in charge. I'm not going to let you worm your way out of it. Moses left and God picked up his paper. He put it back down again and turned to the runt. Yeah, that's a real neat trick. You make your voice come out of the bush. Made it really impressive. The runt was pleased with God's commendation. He looked around and spying a dead rabbit nearby, shoved his hand up its backside and proceeded to have a humorous argument with it. God at first was a little repulsed, but the argument was funny and God couldn't help but laugh. Eventually the man came back. God made the bush flare up and indicated for the runt to go ahead. Why have you returned without my people? The runt asked as impressively as he could. The man was taking so long to get the words out, God was tempted <laughs> to have the runt stick his hand up the guy in the front and carry on both parts of the conversation. The man finally calmed down and explained that Pharaoh wasn't impressed and said no. He'd come back to see if God had any ideas on what he could do next. God and the runt talked for a little bit while the man made sandcastles and waited. The runt gave the man a list of magic tricks that should convince the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. If not, it would be time to play hardball. The run followed the man and helped him to perform all the tricks on the list and even the few the man threw in just to see how much he could do. Pharaoh had magicians of his own and every time the man did a trick, the magicians did the same one. This kind of one-upmanship was, get, one was getting on the run's nerves. Yet the man dipped his staff into Pharaoh's swimming pool. The water turned red and the, missions, the magicians could not turn it back. To make his point clear, the runt caused a leak and all the water flowed into the main waterway, turning that red also. The man flipped the bird to the pharaoh's magicians and hungrily marched out. When the man returned to the mountain, he told of what happened and bragged about what a great magician he was. The runt stood there with his mouth open and his hands on his hips. The arrogance of this guy! The man shouted from the top of the mountain, I am Moses the Great! The run came up behind him and kicked him halfway down the mountain. Moses climbed back up apologetically. Moses' brother Aaron came running up the mountain. Pharaoh had agreed to let the Israelites go. Moses was so happy that he did the jig. Down the run found a nice area that was unpopulated to bring the people to. But first they were to come to the mountain as God had some rules for them to follow. Then God would give Moses a map to the land they would be given. Moses and Aaron left to bring all the Israelites to the foot of the mountain to receive God's laws. Excuse me. While the two men went to get the people together and ready for a journey, God and the run set out the rules they wanted God's people to follow. The run wanted to add one that said, Thou shalt not kill, but God said, Well, Thou shalt not murder. This confused the runt. God, what's the difference? God rose from his prone position. He had been dictating, and the runt was carving the laws into some stones. Now they're going to run up against plenty of folks who no longer believe in us. That means they're going to have to fight a lot. We tell them no killing, then 
how are they supposed to fight and win? You tell them they can't murder, then they can still fight a war. They just can't kill each other. The realm fell to us all the same to the person who's dead. Having worked out all the laws they wanted to hand out, they sat on the edge of the mountain and waited. From a distance, they saw a lot of people arriving. Seeing a multitude, God set about providing for the, this mass of humanity. He created goats and grains in plenty. Since the people were still way off, the runt was sat down on the bottom of the mountain playing with the goats. Hearing a great clamoring of voices, the runt flew up the mountain and waited with God. Moses climbed hastily up the mountain, proud of his accomplishment, and bring God's people hither. As he climbed, he called to the crest of the mountain, I'm here, God. I brought them just like you asked me to. God shook his head as he looked down at the climber. Like I couldn't see him a mile off. God, what an idiot. God went back and rested against an olive tree, and as the man came up over the top, he made the bush flare up again. When God and the man talked, the run flew down the back of the mountain and emerged with wings tucked and joined the very throng. Wandering around, he watched as very few people prayed. Some gambled, some played, and others cooked the goats and made bread. They were distributing all the spoils they had received as departing gifts from the Egyptians. The runt was enjoying the grand party they were throwing. He could have been upset by the lack of prayers going up to God, but after all the time of persecution, he felt it wasn't a bad idea for them to blow off a little steam. It was turning, taking a long time for Moses and God to finish talking. Days turned to weeks and longer. People were beginning to think maybe Moses wasn't coming back, so they set about electing a new leader. The new leader sat on a hillock and pronounced that since Moses wasn't returning, then there wasn't a God for Moses to meet. It all been a ruse for Moses to become king or something like it. People agreed with his reasoning and asked what they should do now. He decided they should, could create a new God who would be answerable to them. Run Herdon was astonished. That's not how this works. You can't create your own God. He rushed around trying to explain things, but the people weren't listening. They built a fire and melted gold. They poured it over a carved image that would serve it for them as a God. The elected leader named himself first priest and had them pray to the golden image. The rent walked up to the image they had created. It was 10 feet tall. The figure was of a man with arms crossed over his chest. The face was simplistic and didn't really look like anyone. Its head was bald and standing on a golden pedestal, it glowed in the fading, fading sunlight. They had named it Oscar. He kicked it and watched as it slowly toppled over. As he flew up to God, he saw them struggling to put the weighty statue back upright. Arriving at the top of the mountain, God was standing with Moses and giving him final instructions. Moses was struggling under the weight of the tablets and looked very uncomfortable. The runt ran out behind God and tugged at the hem of his robe. God waved him away and continued talking, but the runt wasn't to be denied and continued tugging. God swung on him and saw the runt pointing for him to look down where the people were. Sight made God angry and told Moses to hightail it down and get those people in line. Moses scurried down, juggling the tablets as they wobbled in his arms. God had the run to make a new set just in case one was dropped. Moses seemed to be capable of getting the people in line. He and Aaron had to roar and yell and scare them to do it, but they found a way. God looked down at the multitude and stroked his beard. He had grown one after all the paintings and sculptures of him had it. That was what the people expected. He felt it was the only right to look as they wanted him to, even though they had never seen him. He looked at Moses and Aaron, trying to work people into place and appointing leaders, working on how to get this huge mass of people going where God wanted them to. The look of bewilderment on their faces was eloquent, and God had mercy on them. He had the run go in front of them in the shape of a pillar of fire to guide them. Run had never tried to transform himself, and the best he could do looked like a cherry popsicle on a stick. God laughed at the unimpressive sight and transformed him into a powerful pillar of fire that people could see for miles. Once the run was at the head, people got their heads out of their posteriors, realizing that God was watching, and if they didn't show more capabilities, then God might choose another group. 
At the first rest, Moses complained that the tablets were pretty heavy, and could he pass them around for others to carry? The runt flamed a deeper red, signifying air, but changed and told Moses to build a chest for them. That way others could carry them, and they'd be safe. Go. Dad phoned down to the run with specific instructions on the chest construction. The run didn't understand the reason for the detailed list, but passed it on to Moses. As the chest was being constructed, the people started complaining that they didn't feel they had enough food. The run told God, so God had him produce pheasants in plenty. Now the people were complaining they ate too much and were lying on the ground groaning and farting. With the chest constructed, it traveled behind Moses, being carried by some who were made priests and caretakers of the chest. Several felt that since Moses, since there were oxen, maybe a cart could be used instead of them. Moses called them all into line and soundly smacked them for all for impertinence. Some may have thought carrying the chest was a fantastic idea. At the next stop, people were again given pheasant's heat. They sat around gnawing at the birds, grousing about having to eat the same thing all the time. The runt sat on the chest and bemoaned that all the other runs seemed to do was complain. He got God's permission to make manna every morning as an alternative to the pheasants. Of course, the people became greedy and started hoarding. So the runt, runt made what was hoarded and turned into worms. Once more, the people cried out that they were thirsty and there wasn't any lakes or ponds to fill their gourds with. Moses complained to the run, who told him to take his staff and pole, uh, poke, and pole, poke a hole in the rocks nearby. When he did, water began to flow, and the people filled up all the gourds and skins they had. After that, any time they needed water, Moses would pound on a rock face, and water would flow. Moses soon began to make it seem as if he was making the water flow. The runt had a heart to heart with Moses and told him that from now on, if he wanted water from stones, he should lay aside his staff and pray to God to give the water. Moses continued to bash with his staff to the runt's dismay, but people had to have water, so the runt was forced to let it out. God was on his cloud looking over the Israelites and getting more frustrated all the time. All they did was complain and moan about how much better they had it in Egypt and how they wished they hadn't left. When God's anger became too much, he sent down lightning boats down to try and frighten the people to shut the heck up. The first few times it worked, but after a while, they realized God wasn't hitting anyone, so they shrugged and keep complaining. The run was closer, and the constant wailing and whining was getting on his nerves. He was tempted to take them to the promised land immediately, but God was against that idea. His purpose, he said, was to teach his people that being God's chosen came with the responsibilities. The runt was looking tired and wore out, so God decided to spell him for a bit. The runt could rest up and play some pool and cars and enjoy himself. Once God felt it was time, he would switch off again. Besides, he wanted to see what was going on firsthand from where God usually watched the gripes were muted by distance. As he placed himself at the front of the milling throng, he heard not only the horns calling people into place, but the perpetual whining that the runs had spoken of. After a week of hearing this, he had had enough and began contemplating just leaving them here in the middle of nowhere to fend for themselves. There were plenty of other people to choose from. Why saddle himself with this ungrateful throng? He was so upset that he decided to teach him a lesson. Uh, we'll pass over what he did, as it wasn't pleasant. People realized, though, that it doesn't go well when you push God too far, and they felt that they had done just that. To make matters worse, God decided that he would force them to wander around for a much longer time than the trip required. By the time they reached the promised land, they would be so relieved they'd stay in line for a long time. When the runt returned, God stayed instead of going back up. He and the runt took turns either as a pillar of fire or as a wanderer mingling around the crowd and trying to keep them complaining from starting up again. Once when the people were at rest and bored, the runt attempted to liven the mood by sticking his hand up a dead camel and started talking. God had to quickly stop due to the screaming and people throwing up. Let's keep that trip to just between us, he could, admonished. Well, it was coming to an end. After 40 years, God decided that his people were back to the way he wanted them. 
He brought them to a cliff and showed them the land he had promised. It was a good sight, and the people were thankful. They rushed on ahead to claim their inheritance. Moses was an old man now and was trying to go with the rest. The runt was holding on to the hem of his robe, and he couldn't make any progress. Tired of trying, Moses started stomping, yelling, and carrying on. The drunk made a small fire on a nearby bush, and he spoke out of it. Sorry, bub. You remember all the times God told you to just pray for some water and you make it come out? Moses nodded sheepishly. Uh, I kept using your stick and trying to make it look like you were doing it. Well, because you've got a swollen head, just like before, you can see the promised land, but you can't go any further. Moses slowly lowered himself on the ground and lay back on the hard earth. Suddenly his legs were kicking and his hands were beating the ground. I want to go! I want to go! You promised! You promised I'd see the promised land! He sat up, still pounding with his fists. I gave you the best part of my life, and this is the thanks I get? You renege on your deal in the last, at the last minute? It's not fair! And the run made a nice little area for Moses to spend the rest of his life on, and gave him plenty to eat and drink. Every now and then, his children would come up for a visit and let him know what it was like. Around the third visit, they started to do nothing but complain, and Moses was finally glad he had not passed over. Here he was able to rest and have peace and quiet. Once in a while, the runt would visit, and they would play cards and drink a companionable beer together. All right, so those are the ne next two chapters. We got those out of the way. Now, next time we do a reading, we'll do the next two. So we're going to work our way through this pretty good. This is a standalone book. It's not in with any of my other ones. You can find it on Amazon and on um, Smashwords, I think, and Barnes & Noble. So. It's, it's out there very inexpensively. If you want to buy it, I'd really appreciate it. So anyways, that's it for today. We'll be uh, back in a couple of days. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and have a good day. Be good to yourself.